point, I will send the whole lecture. There's a massive reference list, list, massive reference list at the end of this, so you can get all of these references as well. Um, everyone I'm mentioning here is a neuroscientist or a neurosurgeon. So these two guys are saying it's truly astonishing that the dominant model for formal learning is still sit and get or sit and get information. It's not just astonishing; it's embarrassing. And why do we persist when the evidence alone, that lecture alone, does not cut it, is so strong? Now, if you done any years on this course, whether it be part-time or full-time, you probably have to sit for about eight hours a day. And I know after about 15 minutes, especially in like a, you know, a biochemistry lecture, I fall asleep. And I get, also get other problems we're going to talk about. So the model we have for learning is not the optimal model. In fact, we probably should be moving a hell of a lot more. Two other neuroscientists, Middleton and Strick, they've traced a pathway from the cerebellum um, back to parts of the brain that are involved in attention and memory. And they're basically suggesting that the process of learning should involve movement all the time. So I'm getting you to do this because I want you to listen to what I'm saying. I want you to try and take something in. This also talks the same kind of thing. He talks about movement and physical activity are the best ways for a student to learn. It also helps to stop you getting depressed and ADD and addiction, a whole host of problems. So it's also not a bad thing for your health either. Really overdone the research. Um, this is talking about if you study neuroscience, you'll have learned a bit about the reticular activating system. So that's all about kind of your conscious awareness, but also your attention. And you will be much more attentive. And I can see it already. You're actually starting to listen to me now. Now that we've done a little bit of movement, so it's fun and it's play. But it's also what I believe should be the model that we actually learn from. And I'm doing a little bit of my thesis on this. More research. We'll move on. Okay, we still haven't started the main body of the lecture yet because I want to get you guys to rest properly as well. So the, the kind of standard rest position in the Western world, anyway, is what you guys are doing now, which is seated. Um, and I'm going to really talk a lot about the sitting position quite later on in the lecture. But before we go to, into that, I want to teach you about the what's the archetype or the natural positions of rest. Has anyone here got kids? What age are they? Nine and seven. Nine and seven are probably still just about doing these things. Two and a half, they'll be buying on doing these movements. If you watch a kid and the way they play and they interact with the floor, um, you'll recognize all of these positions of movement I put in right now. Now, if you don't use them, you will lose them. And that's why it's going to be quite difficult for some of us to even do these positions of rest. We're so deconditioned now, especially in the Western world, that it's actually we can't actually rest properly. <coughs> there are reasons why, again, that I want you to rest in this way, and I will show you all the research on that. But to show you what some of them look like, and this is only a very select few, and there's nothing magic about this. It's me. Okay, so that's a 1990 roughly hip position. Um, you might have. I remember doing this at primary school every time we were told to sit down and read for a story, they told us to sit cross-legged. Kneeling position, you can do this with on the big toe, so you start to stretch down the posterior side of the foot, or if you want to open up the front of the shin, you would sit in this position. I call this the thinker, um, because I always, when I'm in this position, I kind of always like this. Or I, think, I think there's a famous sculpture where a guy's like this, so I call this the thinker. I'm not sure what the actual name of it is. This is called a long sit. This is probably one of the most difficult natural positions of rest to do as an adult because they've actually got a full anterior tilt of the pelvis in the seat position. You need significant hamstring flexibility to be able to do this, but it's actually a wonderful position if it's, if it's stress-free for you to do. Now, what I'm going to do is actually ask you, there's a visual element to this lecture as well, by the way. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to rest for the remainder of this lecture in those rest positions as best you can. If it's too much, the seats are always there. I'm hoping by the end of the lecture I will convince you that you will not want to sit in a seat again. Um, but you probably can't see that very well, but I asked this guy to make this video because I said to him, look, I cannot study, write essays, do things that I need to do in my life and have these positions, so he sent me this video him on moving in and out of these rest positions, show me well actually is possible. So I'm asking you to join me. There's loads of cushions up here because it can be quite uncomfortable. But all you need to do is sit. 
in any position like this. Now if you ever get stuck in <coughs> what, what position to sit in, just look at May. I know you're trying to video May, but May will always be in a position if you can remember any of those. General things that tend to hurt are hip bones, shins, ankles, cross-legged, so feel free to use the cushions or just spread them around. <laughs> now, one thing I didn't explain very well, because it's coming into the, the sitting portion, is that the idea is not to stay in what, what position you're in now, or you're in now, for the whole time. The idea is to move in and out of these positions. So, and your body will tell you when. Eventually, the front of your ankles are going to actually look quite loose in your body, but eventually, front of your ankles are going to tell you, I'm under a little bit of strain, can you please move? And that's exactly the time when you should move. Okay. So move, walk around, if you want to go back to the seat at any point, feel free to do that, but come back here the whole time. Why bother? What the hell is he going to be doing now? This is the reason why. The reason why <coughs> ultimately is because I love all you guys, and I don't want to kill you. Okay? Hello, by the way. So I, I don't want to kill you, and you guys sitting there for the next 90 minutes would actually bring you closer to death if I was to do that with you. There's an enormous amount of research now on sitting, and again, it's part of my thesis. Uh, let's start with this one. This is quite a recent, a massive Australian study. That the ultimate conclusion was that sitting brings you closer to death and increases your risk of mortality. But, um, this is a quite interesting one to sort of speak about a little bit later. But sitting actually messes up your blood sugar regulation. They don't quite understand the mechanisms why, but they think it's simply because you're not moving. But it makes you much less insulin sensitive. So when the glucose is in your blood, the insulin receptors, they can't get the glucose out of the blood and drive it into the muscle quite as well. It makes sense if you're just still all the time. But if you're constantly moving, squatting, these positions, and you have looked at this as well, do not cause the same problems that you have with blood sugar regulation. Then obviously that leads to the problems you'll get with obesity and you know increased risk of cancer, heart disease, etc., etc. And I'll move on just from that because it's all pretty much saying similar stuff. This is the, the research I was talking about. Um, it was actually a Horizon program a couple of years ago. I don't know if any of you guys can remember it, but they were basically talking about that if, if you don't move all, the, if you don't move regularly, you're going to increase your risk of diabetes. The interesting thing about this was. I think it's on the next slide. The interesting thing about it is that if you sit for eight hours, nine <coughs> hours, ten hours a day, and then you go to the gym or you try and go for a run and exercise for an hour, it does not have any impact on reducing your risk um, or even reducing your mortality risk. It's basically the fact that you're sitting for a long, prolonged period of time that will increase your risk of all these problems. So you cannot exercise it. So the solution to me seems to be to change the rest position, to put yourself in rest positions that do not damage your body as you're kind of some of you are in now. Um, try not to lean on a wall if you can. <laughs> if, if you can, I'm not, I'm not gonna force anyone, but when you do things like that, you're kind of pushing yourself back into the more like a similar seated position. Uh, sitting, just more obvious stuff, I think, from a biomechanical perspective, um, Bridger, He's a physical therapist, did some research in 2003. Mackenzie, I'm sure all you guys have heard of with Mackenzie extensions in May. You? <laughs> um, I don't know who May is. I'm not sure if it's you, but um, they all showed that it can actually reduce your lordosis. So basically, when you see people sit after a while, they start to posteriorly tilt and the back flattens. Your body will always kind of adapt to what you give it. Um, and there's possible links. We do discuss a lot of posture later, so I'm not going to say reduced lordosis does increase your risk of back pain, but I know in my own body when I sit for a long time, especially in lectures, I get a very stiff back and I feel quite bad when I'm sitting all the time. So it truly is, there is no other thing that human beings do as prevalent, as pre prevalent as, as, as often as sitting that brings us closer to death. And I think it's massively underplayed and people, I just don't think people realize how dangerous it is. Now, you might think that this guy is losing the plot, but hopefully, with the research, I've kind of 
showed you that sitting is, is an awful thing for a human body to do as much as we do. And I'm in discussions with um, a guy called Matt Walden, who's part of the Journal of Bodywork and Movement Therapies, and I have proposed that we do a study on primary school children, because when I do this with adults, it is difficult, and you will sort of feel a little bit of pain in these positions, so please move or sit if you need to. But primary school kids should not have this problem. They can move amazingly well, and putting them in a seat for four years old, for hour after hour after hour, is, is a very, well, it's a horrible thing to do to any kid because you're going to destroy their movement potential and you're going to have a big impact on their health. So what we're actually going to do is constantly have them in these rest positions for a few months. We've got a couple of schools that are interested. Mm. Why is it important as us as chiropractors to bother about this stuff? Um, I understand our main tool is, is the adjustment and I'm a massive fan of chiropractic, but we're also health, holistic health practitioners. Now, if you really want to do very easy influence on your patient's health. You want to teach them how to rest properly. Now I know that it's unlikely you're going to say to an old lady, for example, you may say, I want you to sit in this position all day. But I do actually say this to my, my personal training clients, somewhere over my day. And all I say to them is I want you to sit in a squat maybe for about two minutes a day. And that's it. And I believe that will have an impact on our health, a positive impact on our health. The squat we will come to in a moment. And I would encourage you all, at least once, to actually try the squat position. Now, why do you shake your head just that interest? My knee stops that. Sorry, I can't do that one. Right. Just can't. There are wages there for people who put sore knees. But the, the myth, there's a real myth about squat, and I think I'll come to that. The squats are bad for your knees. I would completely argue that statement the other way around. No, but it's not that like, it's bad for them. It just won't be out, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be out. If, if I had 20 minutes with you, I bet I could get you scoring. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Challenge is there. <laughs> <laughs> May, can I show them your score just now, see if it's come up? May never lost her ability to score. And some of you haven't, and some, some of you may be able to score really well, so some of you probably won't. Score is amazing because it's a natural position at rest. It's also a way to assess someone's movement fantastically, which we'll come to later. I've got this all later planned. But just squat down. This, this is a position that every human being, unless they're born with major problems, should be able to do and stay in effortlessly for a long period of time. And May, we, we don't have many chairs in the place where we live. May is in this position non-stop all the time. She cooks, cook, cooks, cleans, moves around in this position. It's also a position you can move in and out of very easily all the time. Um, there we go. There's the best way I think we should use a chair. We had our um, <laughs> we had our lecture, which I don't know if you guys are in the fifth year or fourth year in the full, full time course. Um, but we had our rehab lecture with Christina, and she was talking about sitting, and she was saying, you know, you need to sit right back in the chair. And there is some validity to that, although very questionable research. But I'm not going to take on the, the principal of the college. But my <laughs> argument to that, my argument to that is the next slide takes around even more. But my argument is that there is no good seated position. You see these things called posture chairs and all sorts of things. There is no good single position of rest. Even these rest positions, the, the idea is to move in and out of these positions. And I'll come into why that is. Sorry. Right, that's what Judith's here. Judith always laughs. Movement in sleep, so I'm just trying to maybe open the idea that your body actually wants to move all the time, even when you're resting. So again, we had a rehab lecture and Christina was teaching us positions to sleep in, and I kept quite quiet. But the research is pretty obvious, and anybody that sleeps will know this. So you, can't, you cannot stay still when you're asleep. In fact, your body moves, as more sure, between 40 to 70 times a night. So if you do try and to get into position with your knees together and on your side or lying on your back, your body will move and you will move a lot throughout the evening. And the reason that happens is because there's tiny little mechanoreceptors that are in the interstitial fibers and they're very high uh, density in the periosteum in different parts of your body and there's certain pressure points, I know one's on the inside of your knee, and you'll feel this when you're in these positions. So what happens is after a long sustained time, 